Welcome to the second night of our lectures. Last night we briefly looked at the life and theology of John Calvin, the basic structure of his life and his motto, My heart I give to you, O Lord, promptly and sincerely. We also looked at the basic outlines of his theology, the main points of the sovereignty of God, the word of God, and justification by grace through faith alone. Tonight, we'll be beginning two lectures on a central theme in Calvin, the relationship between our knowledge of God and the knowledge of ourselves. We'll begin this evening with our knowledge of God, our holy creator. This theme comes from the very first sentence of John Calvin's magnum opus, The Institutes of the Christian Religion. Although this work underwent over five editions, from six until its final form in 1559, This first sentence always remained in substance the same. Nearly all the wisdom we possess, that is to say, true and sound wisdom, consists of two parts, the knowledge of God and the knowledge of ourselves. Our next two lectures, I want to help us understand what did Calvin mean by this and how can it help us understand our own place in the world today. Fundamentally, what Calvin is asking here and what he's saying is there are two questions that make up our existence. Who are we? And who is our God? Put in another way, who are we and what do we worship? How are we to maintain our life in this world? Because you see, these things are deeply related. Who you think you are is deeply tied to what gives you worth. And what you give your worth to, what you find worthy of your life and your time, helps define your very identity. So in our next two lectures, we're going to be digging into the scene, hopefully dispersing the confusion that can arise when we do not know who we worship. Without the knowledge of God and ourselves, we stumble about in the world like a maze or a labyrinth. I did not plan the promotional material to have this image, but it worked out so well that I incorporated it into my slides. Calvin says this, for each man's mind is like a labyrinth, so that it is no wonder that individual nations were drawn aside into various falsehoods, and not only this, but individual men almost had their own God. Life can be confusing. And ascribing worth and knowledge and knowing who you are and what you're here for is quite confusing. And you could stumble around bumping into walls and not knowing what comes next. Tonight, I want us to begin by the lights of the Word of God as interpreted by John Calvin to help guide us out. We're going to be dealing with a couple different questions. First, what does Calvin mean by the knowledge of God and the knowledge of ourselves? And how do these two ideas relate to one another? And then we're going to be looking at the first half of Calvin's doctrine of the knowledge of God and self. The knowledge of God as our creator and what it means that we are his creatures. And the knowledge of God as holy and what it means that we are before him as his fallen creatures or that we see ourselves as unholy. This will help us gain a greater knowledge in how we can live in God's world despite its fallenness. And give us, don't forget, there was another lecture on God, our gracious Redeemer. We can never stop merely at God's holiness, but at his grace as well. In some ways, we can see these two lectures as a of sickness. If you want to know what a disease is like, first you must look at the proper functioning being. You have to know what the system is supposed to work like and then see how it has fallen away. Only then can you prescribe the proper cure. If you begin to try to cure diseases before you know what it was supposed to be like to begin with, you can just cause more problems. It's much like that as we come to know God and ourselves. We must begin with creation and how we have marred God's good creation by our sin before we can understand the cure, the answer to that problem in the cross of Christ. So let's begin by thinking about how do these two elements of the knowledge of God and knowledge of self relate. Calvin holds that these two knowledges of self and God are reciprocal, meaning that as one grows in true knowledge of self, one does grow in true knowledge of God. And likewise, as one grows in the true knowledge of God, they grow in the true knowledge of self. Now, there's a very important element to this. We must have the true knowledge of God and the true knowledge of self to grow. If we are building off false knowledge of God and false knowledge of ourselves, rather than moving out, uh, moving deeper and deeper into foolishness. And yet Calvin can say quite clearly that to know ourselves begins with knowing God. And at the same time, without the knowledge of self, there is no knowledge of God. Calvin can say that because the human being was made 
was created in order to show forth who God is. We were made to be the image of God, to show forth God's character and his power in the world. So properly functioning to know human beings was meant from the beginning to show forth God. But you might ask, what what has gone awry? We can look at our own selves and rarely do we see the glory of our creator. Well, Calvin does provide us an answer to that. In a normal functioning, this knowledge of our creator and the knowledge of the creation should work properly. As we come to know God's created world, we come to know the creator. But sin has blinded us and stopped us from being able to see what is properly there. This does not mean that the knowledge of God is completely absent from the world, even because of sin. And Calvin describes this idea that even though sin has blinded us, there is still some sense of knowledge of God in creation. And he calls this in Latin the sensus divinitatis. I do apologize for the Latin, but that is what everyone calls it in Calvin scholarship, so I can't help it. All this does mean is the sense of the divine. God's power is such, his might is such, and his creed is such that Our sin could not wipe out God's knowledge from the world, but he still remains evident. Calvin says, There is within the human mind, and indeed by natural instinct, an awareness of divinity. This we take to be beyond controversy. To prevent anyone from taking refuge in the pretense of ignorance, God himself has implanted in all men a certain understanding of his divine majesty. So there is a knowledge of God that is just suffused in the world as we think of the conscience and the beauty of creation and the grandeur of the image of God, even though it is still ruined. However, this sense of divine, this sense of divinitatis is not enough. We as human beings corrupt it in ourselves and turn it into deep idolatries. Calvin follows this statement up with the claim that the foul ungratefulness of man is disclosed. They have within themselves a workshop graced with God's innumerable works, and at the same time a storehouse overflowing with inestimable riches. They ought then to break forth in praise of him, but are actually puffed up and swollen with all the more pride. You see, God, esteemed above all things with a storehouse of graces and wonder, And instead of giving glory to the one who made us this way, we turn away and we look at ourselves and we take pride in our own accomplishments. This is the misguided nature of our knowledge that can lead us away from the creator and into into folly. So Calvin says, if we're going to properly align these two, we must begin with the knowledge of God. Yes, In perfect creation, we could have looked at this world and seen God as Adam and Eve would in the garden. But given that sin has blinded us and that census divinitatis is only turned into more idolatry, unless we have the spectacles of scripture, if you recall from last night. So we must begin with the knowledge of God to correct our knowledge of self. And only then can we look at this image restored and properly centered. Calvin says, it is certain that man never achieves a clear knowledge of himself unless he had first looked upon God's face and then descended from contemplating him to scrutinize himself. This is the order we will follow tonight, moving from our knowledge creator and trying to move from that to scrutinize who we are. Can we come to know ourselves more fully, more completely, and more truly and grow in wisdom by the knowledge of God. So, this is what Calvin means, this reciprocal knowledge of self and God. He breaks both of these down into a couple ways. First off, God is known in two main ways, as our creator and our redeemer. Calvin says it this way, Since the Lord first appeared in the creation of the world as in general doctrine of scripture, simply as creator and afterwards as redeemer in Christ, a twofold knowledge of him hence arises. God can be known as our creator and our redeemer, and we must take both of them into account as we attempt to know him. Now, don't separate those out. He is as much our creator as as our redeemer. But we must begin with what did he set out to do by creating this world, just as the Bible itself begins with God's creative act. Now, the knowledge of humanity, on the other side, uh, it will be broken up into four ways. But Calvin actually structures his institutes of the Christian religion around these two knowledges, the knowledge of God, the creator, and the knowledge of redeemer, book one and book two. In book one, he looks at who is God, how did he create, what is the nature of providence, how did he create man. 
In book two, we look at God the Redeemer, the coming of Christ, the eternal plan of redemption. And then in books three and four, how does he apply this to his human subjects, his human children? How does he apply salvation to us by the Holy Spirit? And how are we then in book four to live as a redeemed community? So Calvin structures his entire thought around this theme of the knowledge of God and the knowledge of self. But we also must then make a distinction uh, within the knowledge of ourselves. So if we know God as creator and redeemer, in some ways we know ourselves in a negative relationship to that. We know ourselves as we were created to be in the garden with Adam and Eve and what all the gifts they were given in the image of God. But if we're to understand who they were and who we were, we must take a look at what it means that we are fallen. Having a knowledge of ourselves in sin. As I said before, you must know what the disease looks like if you can come to the cure. So tonight we'll be focusing on those, knowledge of God the Creator and knowledge of ourselves as created and fallen. Next time, we'll continue on with the knowledge of God the Redeemer and ourselves as both redeemed, as united, bought by His blood, and ultimately as glorified in the new heavens and the new earth. But as we look at these different knowledges, what sort of knowledge do we mean? Are we merely talking about head knowledge, about mere speculation? No, Calvin, uh, although it is often said that Calvin is a rationalist or a very intellectualized man, uh, it's very much not the case. He wants a knowledge that suffuses our very being, that moves to our heart, that encompasses everything that we are. He wants a holistic knowledge. To show that, Calvin says this about our knowledge of God. And here again, we ought to observe that we are called to a knowledge of God Not that knowledge which, content with empty speculation, merely flits in the brain, but that which will be sound and fruitful if we duly perceive it, and if it takes root in the heart. See, for Calvin, the only knowledge worth having is the knowledge that takes over our entire being. Just as he offers his entire heart up to God, he wants us to have a knowledge of this God that takes over our heart, that renews us from the inside, that leads us correctly in what it means to walk before God. Calvin is here merely picking up a theme throughout Scripture. It is not merely a know that God is. We must know God himself. James mentions in his letter, You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. See, knowledge, simple knowledge that God exists is never sufficient. We must know God is for us. We must know God is with us. And we must know him rightly and truly. This is the sort of knowledge that Calvin is calling us to, a knowledge that is holistic and full and ultimately leads us into God. Calvin continues onward and says, Now the knowledge of God, as I understand it, is that by which we not only conceive that there is a God, but also grasp what benefits us and is proper to his glory. In the end, what is to our advantage to know him? Thus, we should not just know that God is but know what is proper to his glory, what gives him honor, what gives him praise, and how can we glorify him with all of our life. And such a knowledge as this that takes over not just our minds, but our hearts and our wills, and whatever you'd like to include in the human person, all that we are is directed towards the knowledge of God. And Calvin says that this true not stop in the mind, nor does it stop in the heart, but moves outward into acts of piety. True knowledge for Calvin cannot stop. It must reshape us. It must transform us. Calvin says, I call piety, that reverence joined with love of God, which the knowledge of his benefits induces. For until man recognizes that they owe everything to God, that they are nourished by his fatherly care, that he is the author of their every good, that they should seek nothing beyond him, they will never yield him willing service. If you want to come to know God and give him willing service, you must recognize him for who he truly is, for the one who has given you all good things. You must come before him in reverence and awe and love. So this is the sort of knowledge that we are seeking of God. And we come to that by knowing who we are before him, who he has made us to be, what he intended for these good creatures. So as we move and seek this knowledge, let's begin as God, our creator, The Bible opens with God. He spoke and the word came into being. God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in infinite joy and majesty and need of nothing, spoke. And everything that was, from the smallest 
Adam to the most complex thing we can think of, humanity came into being by his will, by his freedom, and by his activity. Calvin says, God, the artificer of the universe, is made manifest to us in scripture, and what we ought to think of him is set forth there, lest we seek some uncertain deity by devious paths. If we want to come to know God, we must begin not in our own mind, not by our own imagining, but as he has revealed himself in scriptures. If you don't want to be led astray in the labyrinth of the world and wander around, you must turn to God where he can be found. And that is in his word set forth. So we're going to begin there in Calvin's thought, the nature of God as our creator. And I want to focus on three points. Uh, again, I'm giving... I'm summarizing a 1,200-page magnum opus of Calvin, so these are just some of the things we could say about his doctrine of God, our creator. But one is this distinction between what does it mean that God is the creator and we are the creature. We call this the creator-creature distinction. God is not merely our creator, but the source of all good. Not just that he acted to create the world, but his character is such that he produces every good gift that we have. And because he is our creator, he is worthy of all of our worship and praise because we owe everything we have to him. So we're going to take these one at a time. Let's begin with a discussion of the distinction between the creator and the creature. This can be boiled down to that God is fundamentally different than us. If we merely think of God as a expanded human being, we will miss the point entirely. God is not just a bigger version of ourselves. He is fundamentally and completely distinct from his creation. He is, as some theologians will say, qualitatively distinct. He is infinitely qualitatively different, a different sort of thing entirely. There are, in fact, only two things that exist. There is God, and there is his creation. There is God who is infinite, eternal, and unimaginably powerful. And then there is the world that he has created, that is finite, that is dependent on him for. See, God is beyond us in every way. And the scriptures repeat this theme throughout. We see it in Genesis 1.1. There was God. He spoke, and then everything else was. God who exists of himself and creation that exists by his will. We see it in 1 Timothy 6, 16, God dwells in unapproachable light. We see it in the many mentions that for God, a thousand years is like a day. But one of the best expressions of this, God's independence, God's power, comes from a statement by the Apostle Paul on Mars Hill in Acts uh, 17. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. There are those things that need to be given life, and then there is God. There are those things that come into being, and then there is God, who always is. If we're going to understand God, our creator, we must understand this fundamental distinction. He is not like us. His ways are not our ways. Calvin unpacks this for us briefly in his commentary on the Lord's Prayer. And he's reflecting on what does it mean when we say, our Father who art in heaven. Because Calvin points out, well, of course God is in heaven, but he's not restricted to heaven. He is everywhere. How do we say this? God who is in heaven. And Calvin says it's to acknowledge that he is so far above us. Calvin says it this way. Therefore, it is as if he had been said to be of infinite greatness or loftiness, of incomprehensible essence, of boundless might, and of everlasting immortality. But while we hear this, our thought must be raised higher when God is spoken of, lest we dream up anything earthly or physical about him, lest we measure him by our small measure or conform his will to our emotions. See, Calvin is saying here, as we say, our Father who art in heaven, we're supposed to understand that he is so far above us, so far beyond us, that we cannot conform him to our limitations. He is not small. He is not limited. And look at the things that Calvin is saying. Don't even let these confound him. His infinite greatness and his incomprehensible essence and his boundless might. Don't even let those ideas bind him into our small measure. God is beyond. God is our king, the infinite creator. If we are going to come to God and come to him rightly, we must get this distinction down. He is not merely a human being with whims and wills to be swayed that way or the other. He is the creator and we are his creature. 
He is infinite. We are finite. He is all-powerful and omniscient, and we are frail and weak. He is beyond measure, and in compared to him, we know nothing. He is independent of all things, and we depend upon him for everything that we are. In sum, he is God, and we are not and never can be. If we are to come before him, we must know him rightly. God is superior to us in every conceivable way and to an unconceivable degree. It's only when we grasp this truth can we understand what grace really means. This one, who is unconceivably above us, is also the source of all goodness and all grace. He is not only the creator of all things, he is the supplier of all good. This comes together with the theme of Calvin, of God as the provider, the God of providence. Calvin says that for unless we pass on to his providence, his giving of himself and all gifts to his people, however we may seem both to comprehend with the mind and to confess with the tongue, we do not yet properly grasp what it means to say God is creator. You see, God did not create the world and then walk away. God did not say, let there be light and then go and make a sandwich. Engage with the world at all times and in all ways. Calvin uh, works this out in one of his sections saying, It will not suffice simply to hold that there is one God whom all ought to honor and adore, unless we are also persuaded that he is the fountain of every good, that we must seek nothing else than in him. This I take to mean that not only does he sustain this universe as he once founded it, but his boundless might regulate it by his wisdom, preserve it by his goodness, and especially rule mankind by his righteousness and judgment, bear up with it in his mercy, watch over it by his protection, but also that no drop will be found either of wisdom and light or of righteousness or power or rectitude or of genuine truth which does not flow from him. And of which he is not the cause. Not only does God speak and act and create this world, but he sustains it. He is with it always. And every good, every good thing comes from the Lord. As his grace, his gift, God is infinitely above us, and yet he reigns on the just and the unjust and gives his mercy. Many theologians will call this concept common grace, that God will still shower all wisdom and light. God gets all the glory for all good in the world, no matter who it is done by. So God is our creator, infinitely distinct from us, and the source of all good. And because of these two things, he is utterly worthy of our worship. As God, he alone is worthy of our devotion and worship. He has given us everything we are. We owe him our very life, our very being, and our very existence. And I know at times you might find that quite commonplace, but it is actually quite remarkable. There is no reason that you exist. You exist purely by the will of God. There is no reason you continue to exist except that the infinite will of your Creator says it is so. There is no reason that you have many good things except that the Lord of Lights has given them to you. When we stand before God our Creator, we must understand that He owes us nothing. Because he's given us everything. And yet he still showers us with goodness. Showers us with his love. And Calvin says, it is for this reason. As every good without exception comes from him, so every praise should rightly return to him. As every good comes from God, all praise should return as what is due to him for his kindness and his mercy to us. This is our knowledge of God, our creator, that he is fundamentally distinct from us in every way, that he is the source of all good we experience in this life. And because of this, he is worthy of all of our worship and praise. So just briefly, I'd like to bring to mind a couple alternatives to this because it helps to bring it out. We often can say God is our creator, but live as if the world is quite different. One of the clear examples of this is the continual worshiping of the creatures or idols that replace the creator God and come out of our midst. As we saw before, humans are prone to take that sense of the divine and turn it and place it on other things, giving themselves glory and honor. Calvin is renowned for his statement that the human heart is a factory of idols, and this is certainly true. When we turn to created things rather than to God, We are committing 
cosmic treason. God trusted us with everything. He's given us all things. And when we worship the creature, we are committing the worst crime imaginable. We are rejecting the ground of our own being, the love that brought us into existence. And what makes it so sad is when we worship the creature and so the creator is we're also doing it for something that can never satisfy us. So by worshiping the creature, we commit treason and it's not even worth it. An alternative to this is a world that is devoid of God, made of just chance, devoid of a creator. And this is a rather popular belief in the modern world, a world in which there is no rhyme, there is no reason. It is merely a product of random events occurring in a long enough time, uh, perhaps with monkeys and typewriters, depending. In this, what we must recognize is neither can this satisfy the deep longing of the human heart. If we do have the sense of the divine, if we have some sense of meaning and existence, a world of chance cannot provide that meaning. It cannot satisfy our longing for the good. Because in a world of chance, there is no good. There is no justice. There is no love. There merely are random particles interacting with each other. And that is actually it. Everything else we say, if we want love, if we want justice, those are just words that we are making up. Just chance. All that exists is random particles running into each other. But that is not the case because justice does exist. Goodness does exist. Truth does exist. It is founded in the creator of this world who brings it into being. And also even more prominent maybe in our uh, modern day is the myth of self-creation. So instead of acknowledging something else as our originator, we claim that we can make ourselves, we can be Promethean man, stealing fire from the gods and living how we want to live, defining our identity how we want to define it. However, this also runs afoul and does not satisfy because we are not producing something stable and in line with reality, but creating a false knowledge that leads us away from God. So knowledge of God as our creator might seem like a simple thing, but it is actually one of the things our sinful nature will take wrong time and time again. While you might see these as extreme examples in our daily lives, in small ways we give in to them time and time again, not seeing God's hand in the production of that which is good, worshiping our own success, or trying to define our own identity over and against God, not seeing ourselves for who he is. So if we are not supposed to give in to a myth of self-creation, what does it mean that we are created by God himself foundationally? And fundamentally, the human being was meant to be made in the image of God. He was meant to be the height of God's creation. Man and woman were meant to fulfill a purpose, to give glory to their creator, to give him honor and praise. Calvin uh, is often accused of having a very dour view of humanity, especially for his doctrine of sin. But we must see what he says about humanity when we don't count sin. He says this, we must now speak of the creation of man, not only because among all God's work, here is the noblest and most remarkable example of his justice, wisdom, and goodness. This is what you were meant to be, a stark example of the goodness, justice, and wisdom of God, God's own image in the world that was meant to be fruitful and multiply and have dominion. This is what humanity was created for. We must begin with this. We are to know who we are. We have to know what was the plan? What was the intention? Why were you made? We as human beings were made to image God. As Genesis 1 makes quite clear, so God created man in his own image. God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Humanity was supposed to rule over God's creation in his power and his goodness, and in doing so to show forth God's majesty and his love. Rather, in the fullness of God's love and power and infinite majesty, he gave us a task. To be mirrors, to be mirrors of his nature in the world he created, a task of nobility and grandeur and meaning. 
serving the one true God of the world and unfolding its mysteries in worshipful acts before God, our creator. It's for this reason that humanity was created the image of God, that David in the Psalms can break out and say, What is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. This is what we were meant to be. God, our creator, made us to image him, to rejoice in him. Commenting on this statement, From uh, Psalm 8, Calvin says, For the dominion over all things which come men, it is evident how great is the love which he has borne towards them, and how much account he has made of them. As he does not stand in need of anything himself, he has destined all the riches, both of heaven and earth, for their use. It is certainly a singular honor, and one which cannot be sufficiently estimated, that mortal man, as the representative of God, has dominion over the world, as it pertains to him by right, and that to whatever quarter he turns his eye, he sees nothing wanting which may contribute to the convenience and happiness of his life. The lofty position that God has given to his creatures should turn our hearts and our minds back to our Creator, who provides us not only all blessing, but purpose itself. You were made to image God and all your thoughts, words, and deeds. This was the factory default, if you will, of the human being that has gone deeply, deeply awry. You see, sin entered the picture. With the fall, image was distorted and deformed so that the initial to show forth the glory of our Creator in this world has become something very different. As Calvin says, the image of the fall was so vitiated or weakened and almost blotted out that nothing remains after the ruins except what is confused, mutilated, and disease-ridden. This is where Calvin's darker view of humanity comes in, not in our essence, but in our fallenness. Not in our being, but in our sin. See, by the fall of Adam and Eve and our continual sin, we live not as God would have us live, but in rebellion, in rejection of God. We have become fallen. We do not live as we ought to live. But as we reflect on knowing ourselves as properly created, we should realize that's not the way it's supposed to be. That's broken. The knowledge of the human being is not one who sins but one who follows God. It is this sin that is wrong, that is not natural, that is abnormal. Proper human functioning is worship and glory and righteousness. But in this, we must acknowledge that we ourselves, as we were created, were made to do marvelous things. Not for our own sake, but for our Creator, the God of this universe. And by the fall, What was supposed to be a perfect relationship with God, our Lord, was broken. What was supposed to be a loving service amongst one another was shattered. What was supposed to be a self that could understand who we were and who God was and what it meant to be a human being, that has been broken and we're in confusion and doubt. And our activities in the world, that was meant to be dominion, showing forth God's loving kindness, his mercy and his benevolence to his creation, has turned into destruction and exploitation. All of this has come undone. And God is not pleased. You see, our Creator is not merely the one who has given us all things, but He is holy. He is righteous. He is good. So let us turn now from God our Creator and ourselves as created and yet fallen to God, who is Himself holy. To see this, let us begin with a text from Scripture. This is the temple vision from Isaiah 6. It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted and seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, Holy Holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voice, the doorpost and threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe is me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, 
and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. This is Isaiah coming to a knowledge of himself. He is a man created who is broken and fallen before the holy God of the universe, and he cries, Woe. As seraphim fly around, beings that if we were to encounter them, we would fall down and be tempted to worship them, as we see throughout. They must hide their face at this God. He is holy. He is majestic. He is beyond us in every way. And therefore, that sin, that fallenness, that cosmic treason that our first parents committed and we are complicit in every single day, we have rejected this good and gracious God. We have rejected the Holy One, and He will not stand for it. Because He is pure and He is righteous. Calvin, commenting on this statement from Isaiah, says, This description holds out to us, as in sunbeams, the brightness of God's infinite majesty, that we may learn by it to behold and adore His wonderful and overwhelming glory. As we come to try to understand ourselves, we must do so in light of this wonderful and overwhelming glory of God. You see, this refrain of holy, holy, holy doesn't stop in the temple vision, but continues throughout all of creation. And we see its refrain in Revelation 4 as the four heavenly beings are around the throne crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is, and is to come. This worship call of creation is speaking forth God's very being, the Holy One, the One who will not tolerate sin. Holiness is a difficult term. It is big, it is massive, and sometimes in the church we use it so often that we fail to understand and grasp its meaning. It is heaviness, it is purity, it is all of these things together. Um, And it's hard to wrap our head around. To grasp this a little more, I'd like us to use a quotation and a definition by contemporary theologian, I guess late theologian, John Webster, uh, who uh, got most of this from Calvin. But he says, Talk of God's holiness denotes the majesty and singular purity which the triune God is in himself and with which he acts towards and in the lives of his creatures, opposing that which is itself opposed to his purpose as creator, reconciler, and perfecter. In this, it's a singular purity, a radiance, a distolerance of all things opposed to his purposes as creator and redeemer and perfecter. And this can be because his goals as the creator, redeemer, and perfecter are perfect. And so by dint of going against them, as we do as sinful beings, as the dark powers do, is to come into conflict with him. And God will overcome it because it is his perfection. Maybe more simply put, Webster says, holiness is pure majesty in relation. See, God himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, relates purely in majestic holiness. And he relates to us purely. However, that is not always something we want. Because what happens when the pure comes into contact with the impure, the holy with the unholy? Now, normally, the unholy will contaminate. The filthy will dilute the pure, but not so with God. He is utter radiant purity. He must destroy that which is filthy in us. He must overcome that which is ugly. He is purity and radiance and majesty. His very being is opposed to our sin and our rejection of him. Calvin says, commenting on the statement, God is light, that he makes all things so manifest by his brightness that he suffers nothing vicious or perverted, nor spots or filth, nor hypocrisy or fraud to lie hidden. God will expose it all, because that is what he does, and it is opposed to his very nature. In this, we see God as our holy creator. He not merely made this world, but he will perfect it. He will bring it back to himself. And he is opposed to all of our sin and our fallenness. He is undefiled and hates sin because it is the exact opposite of his nature. He is light to the darkness of sin. He is love 
to the hatred of sin. He is beauty to sin's ugliness. And he is purity and cleanliness to the filth and stain of our sin. It is only when we understand this that we can understand how much we owe him and how costly our actual salvation was. Sin is not a parking ticket. Sin is not a minor offense, but it is a uh, slap in the face to God's very being. It is spitting in the eye of the creator of the universe and saying, I know better and you are less than me. Imagine a person saying that to you, as weak as you are, and as right as they might very well be. But to say that to God with our every breath and our every sin cannot be tolerated. And so when we see this, remember, we will get to God, our gracious Redeemer, soon, but we can't appreciate how gracious and how glorious a Redeemer he is if we don't understand the depths of the, the depths and how much it goes against God's goodness and his mercy. To sum up, Calvin will dig into this, bringing all this together in a very long quote, but please bear with it because it is quite glorious. Commenting on Romans 1 21, he brings this all together of God's great glory. He says, no idea can be formed of God without including his eternity, power, wisdom, goodness, truth, righteousness, and mercy. His eternity appears evident because he is the maker of all things, his power because he holds all things in his hands and continues their existence, his wisdom because he has arranged things in such an exquisite order, his goodness for there is no other cause than himself why he created all things and no other reason why he should be induced to preserve them, his justice because in his governance he and defends the innocent, His mercy, because he bears with so much forbearance the perversity of men, and his truth, because he is unchangeable. He, then, who has a right notion of God, ought to give him the praise due to his eternity, wisdom, goodness, and justice. Since men have not recognized these attributes in God, but have dreamt of him as though he were an empty phantom, they are justly said to have impiously robbed him of his glory. This is God, our holy creator, infinite majesty and glory. And before that, we must come to know ourselves. How do we measure up to the Holy One of creation? How do we as fallen come before this God? I think we know quite well. God's holiness can only confront us and our failure to live as his creatures, as his image bearers, as he meant us to be. We have fallen short of his glory, and his holiness must convict us of this sin. In seeing God and this holiness, we must confess that we have fallen short, that we can in no way amend this wrong. But the holiness of God is not only a negative quality, it also shows us that there is a standard of righteousness and justice. That world we discussed in which there is nothing but chance is not. There is truth, there is goodness, there is purity, and it comes from God himself. Let's take these briefly in turn. When we come to the holiness of God, we are exposed. We are brought new. You see, every man is the hero of his own story. Everyone is really righteous in their own eyes. How many times have you gotten to an argument or a fight and, no, but I was really right. Yes, I know that was wrong, but there is a good reason why I did it and why it's not as wrong when I do it, but when they do it, much wrong. Okay? Um, you realize that every tyrant, every murderer in history thought they were doing what was right. Nobody actually goes out and does what they think is not the right thing to do. Because if they did, they wouldn't do it. Whenever we're doing these things, because we think we have a reason. And it's good enough. And right, So I might be not be the best person, but I'm definitely better than that person and that person and that person. So that means I'm okay. I'm not in last place. This all is shown for the nonsense it is when we stand before the holy God. And he standard for our activity. The right standard of what we were made to be as the image bearers of God. Calvin says, for that we always seem to ourselves righteous and upright and wise and holy. This pride is innate in all of us, unless by clear proofs we stand convicted of our own unrighteousness, foulness, folly, and impurity. And in fact, coming before God, we must be. Looking at God's purity, his goodness, his justice, and his truth, 
we must admit that we ourselves are unholy. We have fallen short of the glory of God, and we must beg his mercy. This is the main thrust of God's holiness to our unholiness, to bring us to an admittance of our sin and our guilt. We'll see next time that that brings us to Christ, the proper image of this holiness in human form, who lived this perfect holy life and confronts us himself with salvation and glory. But not only does God's holiness confront us with um, the power of God and the fallenness of our nature, but it also gives us a real standard, correcting our vision of this world and giving us right. Now, this might be a little bit more of an experiment, but this is an image to tell me which square is lighter, A or B. And now you know I'm probably tricking you, because why would I do this if I weren't tricking you? But this is a famous optical illusion, and it goes to show how skewed our perceptions can be of mere light, uh, of mere color. How much more our perceptions of morality and truth can be easily confused when we're not properly oriented. Oh, and just to preview, they're the same. They are exactly the same. I'm not doing anything tricky either. It's just moving that piece up. So, if our eyes can be deceived so quickly to see light as dark and dark as light, our sense of goodness and truth in the world just as likely is askew. It needs a right ordering. It needs a straight edge to find out what is the right way to live, what is the good way to follow God. And Calvin makes this point quite clearly, and that's why I thought of this image. He says, just so an eye in which nothing is shown but dark objects judges something dirty white or even rather darkly modeled to be whiteness itself. You see, if we're only ever exposed to things that are sinful and dark, we're going to continually think that the thing that's just a little less sinful is purity itself. But the holiness of God confronts us with something entirely different, with purity itself, with holiness itself, the holy creator of the world. And this, unless we have this reworking, we will just be continually confused in the labyrinth of our own minds. As Calvin says, but allurements readily seize the unwary, and they are drawn more and more deeply into the labyrinth. The outcome is that when each one is pleased by his own opinions, there is no end of disputing, unless we come to a real standard of truth, a real standard of holiness, we will continue to be confused. We must come to the knowledge of God as our holy creator and see ourselves as his creatures who were made to be in his image. Yes, we have fallen, but we were made for something glorious. So tonight we've looked at Calvin and the beginnings of this twofold knowledge of God and self. We know God, our creator, who is infinitely above us in every way, who is the source of all goodness and truth, and who is worthy of all of our worship. We've looked at the knowledge of ourselves as his creatures. We're meant to be in his image, to be a mirror of his nature to this world. And yet we have fallen. We've looked briefly at his holiness, his infinite purity, his pure majesty in relation, and in ourself as unholy. Now, this is not enough, and this is in many ways news. If I were to stop my message here, you have a holy creator, and you can never stand before him. Um, this is not a very happy setting. However, this is not the end of the story. This is only the beginning. In fact, you could say this is only Genesis 1 to 3. The Holy Creator, though, is not idle. He shows himself to be the gracious Redeemer as well. The Father will send the Son, perfect in holiness, the perfect image bearer to take our place to live the life that we ought to live and die the death that we deserve to die for our unholiness. And by the Holy Spirit, we will be renewed and redeemed and set free to know God truly and rightly. However, to appreciate that message fully, to understand that gospel, that good news of the redemption of Christ Jesus, we must fully appreciate the bad news of sin and the one who is actually saving us, the one who is actually entering into this world. This is our holy creator, who we owed everything and owed us nothing. The Holy One who cannot stand sin entered into the sinful world to redeem it. 
Only when we see this can we see God's grace to everything and owes us nothing. There is no quid pro quo with God. We give him something and he gives us something in return. All that we have, he has given us. Even our perfect obedience is nothing less than his due. We owe a debt that we can never pay to the holy creator of the universe. And in his mercy and in his grace, he paid it in Christ's cross. Tomorrow evening, we will dig deeper into this to see how our holy creator became our gracious redeemer in Jesus Christ and how we can come to know ourselves not only as creatures who have fallen into sin, but as redeemed children of the Most High God. Thank you very much.